Good evening. I am super excited to be a part of this summer series. Tonight we are going to be talking about David and we're going to kind of zero in on the story of David and Goliath. Now I know that looking at the character of David there's actually quite a bit more than that in the Bible concerning David but for our purpose tonight we'll be focusing more on David and Goliath. So if you want to look in your Bibles tonight, you can find that in 1 Samuel chapter 17. So I'm going to go through, I'm not going to read the whole text, but I am going to take a few minutes to kind of um, summarize, maybe read some verses. So if you want to have your Bibles open, you want to follow along, great. If you just want to listen, either way. Now, if you see me kind of look over, I'm looking at my notes or my Bible, um, but kind of going back to our text in Hebrews chapter 11, we've been looking at the idea of faith and how faith is kind of, it's this conviction and this assurance. So conviction and assurance equals faith. Another idea that I kind of want to put out there is that faith is belief put into action. Now, I actually totally stole that from Jeremy Myers. I was talking with him about this and asking him, Jeremy, what's just a, a really good practical way to explain faith to somebody? And he told me that, and I thought it was just wonderful. So faith is belief put into action. And we kind of see how James talks about faith without works and how it's dead, so when we're looking at a good, sound, biblical faith, we're looking at actually putting what we believe into action in a way that creates change around us, impacts the kingdom of God in a positive way. So starting in chapter 17, we have two armies that are ready to fight. We have Israel on one side of the mountain, and the Philistines on the other side. And in between them is a valley. Now, they line up, they're ready to fight, and then a giant named Goliath comes out and starts taunting. He wants Israel to send one man out to fight him. If that one man loses, Israel will be the Philistines' servants. If Goliath loses, the Philistines will be the servants of Israel. So we have this, uh, right off the bat, this confrontation. Now, what's interesting is we see two reactions to the situation, okay? The first reaction we see is actually fear and inaction. And that actually shows a lack of faith and ends up creating a lack of productivity or fruit in God's kingdom. So Israel is afraid by this man. There's no one in the Israelite army that wants to go out and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this giant. The other reaction that we see is actually assurance and conviction, which is the biblical faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And that belief is actually put into action, and it produces tremendous results for God's kingdom, right? And we see that from David. So David is tending sheep. He's asked by his old, older father, Jesse, to go check on his three older brothers that are in the army. Goliath has been taunting Israel for 40 days, okay? He has been hurling all kind of insults at them, at God himself, and really just putting their feet to the fire. I want to read in verses 32 through 37. Um, David gets to the camp to check on his brothers, and right off the bat, David hears what this giant is saying, and David's angry. And I, and I actually love the interaction between David and his brother um, because, you know, the brother is very dismissive to him as he's hearing David talk. 
and um, basically says, why don't you go back to tending the few sheep that you, you're in charge of? Um, and David pretty well shuts him down and moves on to what the real problem is. The giant that is taunting um, not only Israel, but disrespecting God. So in verse 32, and I've got Bible right here, verse 32 of chapter 17, says, And David said to Saul, so men hear David talking, and, and they bring him before Saul. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And so I'm going to go ahead and read a little bit further. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. So David was young. David was very young. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be no, shall be one of them, shall be like one of them, I'm sorry. For he has defiled the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go. The Lord be with you. So I read up to verse 37. But Saul goes ahead and gives him permission. David says, hey, I've killed lions, I've killed bears. God has delivered me. This uncircumcised Philistine is not going to be any different. Now, I don't know about you, but I would probably be more like one of the men in the army. I would be afraid. Um, I've never tended sheep. I have certainly never killed a bear or a lion with my bare hands. Okay, So I would be very afraid. But David takes a different approach. Instead of thinking about himself, he thinks about the injustice that is happening on God's behalf. And he has faith in what God can do, not only for him, but for the situation at hand, for his own name. So God is in control, and David knows this, and David has faith in that, and that leads him to action. Now, in verse 39, um, verse 39, then... It says, And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Da then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. So it's talking about Saul's armor. So Saul tries to give him his armor, his weapons, and David says, Listen, I haven't tested these. I, I don't, th this doesn't feel right. I'm not, I'm not going to use these. So, David takes a different approach. David gathers five smooth stones for his sling, and he walks to face the giant. So we're talking about David facing a giant who has, he doesn't even carry his own shield, his own weapons, his own stuff. He has somebody to carry that for him, okay? He has all this weaponry, all this armor, all this experience, and obviously the size. And David has the clothes on his back and five smooth stones with his sling. Now, David's reaction is, is just, it's priceless to me. And I want to go ahead and read what David says, because David shows so much faith in this moment. For 40 days, the army has been of Israel has been cowering. But David in this moment really shows true faith. Standing before someone who it seems would almost certainly kill him. 
let's go ahead and read that. So in verse 41, if you want to follow along, I'll be reading in verse 41 through 48, okay? So 40, verses 41 through 48. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beast of the field. Okay, that would scare me half to death. But David's reaction in verse 45, he says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hand. Wow. So, David is not going to back down. Okay. So we know what happens. David strikes him in the head with a stone. He falls down. David cuts his head off. And the Philistines are shaken. And Israel chases after them, and the battle is won. So, this is not the way that I would typically expect the story to end. But, the thing is, God uses the simple to show how great he is, right? So, like I said, we see two reactions in the story. We see fear and inaction on the part of the Israelite army. And then we see, on David's behalf, assurance conviction. Assurance and conviction that leads to action, right? And it actually results in a giant win for the, no pun intended, for the army of Israel. So, Kind of getting into our own lives and applying this story, we all have spiritual giants in our lives. And what I want to ask is, are we meeting those faithful, are we meeting those spiritual giants in a faithful way? Or are we more like the Israelite army and are we meeting them in more of an unfaithful way, more of a more of a way that is based on fear, right? So notice David wasn't confident in himself. He was confident in God and, and in what God could do through him in order to bring glory to the one true God. So it can be really easy as Christians to simply stay silent or be complicit. Instead of creating change, the needed change around us and making the world look more like what God intended it to be. So God doesn't call us to be silent. Now that doesn't mean that we can be rude or belligerent. Doesn't mean that we have to look down on other people. It's, it's not that at all. God hasn't asked us to lash out on Facebook or act in an unloving way. In fact, it's quite the opposite. In Galatians 6.1, I would like to go ahead and read that. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So it's important to always take a stand like David, but to do it in a spirit of love and gentleness. We aren't supposed to look like the world. Now, David had tools for the job. And kind of getting practical, I want to think about what are our tools today. So David had stones, he had a sling, 
he had different tools that he used to meet the job, okay? Um, today, we have the Bible. We have prayer. We have fellowship with each other. Now, I know our fellowship is kind of a complicated thing right now with the current circumstances, but there are a lot of great ways that we can still fellowship with one another and be safe. You know, uh, I have had so many people reach out to me either virtually or drop something off on my doorstep or whether it's stopping by the office to have a cup of coffee with Mike. I mean, you name it. Um, there's a lot of ways that we as Christians can um, still fellowship in safe ways. So there's a lot of tools that we had, we have, but also David didn't just have tools for the job. He had faith in the creator who allowed him to do the job, right? You could also think about the fact that David's tools, while they seemed inadequate and small, they got the job done. You know, God gives us very simple tools that we can use to face our spiritual giants. Lastly, I think it's important to notice that while people on this list, and I'm referring to the chapter 11 of Hebrews, the Hall of Fame of Faith, think about people like Abraham and David and Samson. And there's a lot of people on the list who had amazing faith, but they also had parts in their lives where they might have been faithless. They had times when they struggled, right? One of my favorite people in the Bible, even though he's not on this list, is Peter. And he's a really good example of how he struggled with faith at times, but also excelled in faith at times. And, and eventually he kept working until he had a lifestyle that reflected the faith that God calls us to have. So I think it's important for us to think about, well, while we look at these heroes of faith, they, they had their struggles and their moments of faithlessness. And I think that's important because sometimes it can be easy for us to look at them and think, wow, these people are so faithful. These people are so good that we can't relate to them. We can't relate to David facing a giant. And certainly I've never been in that situation and never will. But I have situations in my life that require me to have faith. And I can look at David's life, and I can relate to him. He was human. He made mistakes, too. I think about David and Bathsheba. I think about Abraham and some of the situations he got himself into. But even though these people might have made a mistake, their lives were not characterized by faithlessness their lives were characterized by faithfulness. Everyone makes mistakes, but as Christians, daily we're supposed to be putting the flesh to death and walking in the Spirit. These people daily had faith. Okay, Our daily living should be characterized by faith that cultivates actual fruit for God. We need to be people of assurance and conviction who take action, who stand up to our own spiritual giants. Remember, faith is belief put into action. So my challenge when we're looking at the story of David and Goliath, and when we're thinking about our own personal walk of faith, my challenge would be to let's be people of faith, people of action. God has given us many practical tools to face our spiritual giants and create change around us. So let's use them. Let's put this year's theme into action and make this world look more like heaven. We all have spiritual giants. We all struggle, but as citizens of God's kingdom, we have to take our faith, our belief, and we have to put it in action, and we have to 
try our best to change the world around us in a way that reflects the qualities of God. We need to make earth look more like heaven. I have really enjoyed being with you tonight. I have a verse that I would really like to read as we close. It's from Philippians. So if you have your Bible, you want to turn over there. It's Philippians chapter 3. And it's going to be verses 8 through 14. And and um, this is Paul talking about his walk of faith. And I think it's important for us to have the same mentality. So starting in verse... Eight. Let's start reading. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Have a great week, guys. Stay safe.